Greetings, friends. It is Monday, and I have only one thing to say that is at the top of my mind this week, and that is simply, busting makes me feel good. Yes, that's right. Ghost busting. Busting makes me feel good. Uh, I bring it up because it's just that line has been stuck in my head because I watched the movie over the weekend, like Catherine hadn't seen it in forever. And in the Ray Parker Jr. song, Ghostbusters, the Ghostbusters theme, he says, Bustin' makes me feel good. Who and doesn't us? it, folks? Don't Who we love it? Us? Don't we love to bust? Bustin' I, um, makes me feel good. I've never seen any of those movies. Wow. Well, I mean, I That's watched it. That's fucked up. I mean, like, I probably Ghostbusters is the, I mean, I, I wrote about it on Letterboxd, but it's probably, like, the most important movie to my childhood and, like, you know, development into a human being is probably more based on that movie than anything else. I, I would probably put it in a similar spot for me. It, it, if not number one, it's, it's, in the, it's in the running. Well, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. It's, like, was the first horror film ever made. It's the scariest. <laughs> it's scary. Everyone it acknowledges it. it, it yeah. It was, that fucking... That is that a Bowie song? That magic song? Uh, no, no, it's a, no, it's not. It's not Bowie. It's a please, yeah, please. It's actually Mick God. Smiley. Mick Smiley. All those spooky is ghouls of coming out of the ground, coming out of the uh, twin uh, towers. The the, 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 the the skeleton cab driver, uh, uh, Slimer eating all of those hot dogs. When the, the that would be pretty scary. The dogs, uh, imagine, the gargoyle dogs. Yeah. Imagine you're trying to have a classic Park Avenue day, and. <laughs> You just it's like the twilight zone it's like oh everyone got haunted out of new york i can finally enjoy central park to myself oh no they ate all the hot dogs that's horrifying please bustin makes me feel good got a lot on my mind today um <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of things going on but uh I, I suppose we should just um uh start out the news with a statement from our president and yours, Donald J. Trump, 45th president of the United States of America, uh, from the desk of Donald Trump, May 9th, 2021. So now even our Kentucky Derby winner, Medina Spirit, is a junkie. This is emblematic of what is happening to our country. The whole world is laughing at us as we go to hell on our borders, our fake presidential election, and everywhere else. There you have it, folks. America has fallen so low that even our Kentucky Derby winners are junkies now. Washed up junkie psycho. <laughs> Medina yeah. Spirit. Junkie loser stealing stealing change from their parents. That's the best part. So what happened is is that the Kentucky Derby winner tested positive for horse steroids. Which by the and, way, like every single horse race winner of any race of note is on drugs of some kind. Well, obviously. There's still I mean, like the idea is like do a, it. Are, 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 are people begging for um, uh, integrity to the return to the world of uh, horse racing? Probably the if crookedest you, sport ever invented. Other than boxing. If you win like one of the triple crown races, that that horse's that horse's cum is worth Five hundred thousand dollars a shot glass or something. Why would you the, not fucking well, it, it tastes, dope it the hell? It tastes amazing. <laughs> I, I mean, like this. Okay, well, like you know, we we, we can have debates over you know uh, the the we can have debates over whether this is a clean sport or not. I guess it's not, but like the horse steroids aren't bad because they impugn the integrity of horse racing. I mean, we all remember what happened when Chris Benet killed his family because of his influence under poor steroids when he crushed them all under bales of hay. <laughs> My favorite thing is that he called the horse a junkie. Yeah. yeah like, 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 like it was, it was shooting up in the and stables. the jockey went into the bathroom stall and he like knocked on it and the horse is tying off. He's like, not now! <laughs> not now, God damn it. It's like the horse is... It's like, and it's, the horse isn't like, hit me up. The, ho the poor horse just was... Doing living its life, its psycho owner is the one filling it with drugs so that he could make more money. <laughs> Medina you know, blame the fucking horse. Medina Spirit arrested last night in Tompkins Square Park. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then uh, I did it, it. The, the well, the thing is, like uh, the horse steroids. You know, it's not so much that they impugn the integrity of the the sport of kings, horse racing, is that they impugn the integrity of uh, horse semen and how it tastes. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it leaves a sort of an oaky note that I could do without. We're sort of. Uh, Bearing the lead here that uh, Trump finally unveiled his alternative to Twitter, which is not, as a lot of people assumed it was going to be, some sort of competing social media site, but instead a blog. 
<laughs> they, from the they, yeah, they, yeah, it took Donald them six J. months Trump. and probably like ten million dollars to make a blog that he could post little little creed thoughts, and then you have an option: you can heart it, and all that does is just make the heart light up, or you can send it to Facebook and Twitter. It, it's not even like a blog. It's like it reminds me of when people would make like personal websites in like two thousand. <laughs> just like you know. Willie Willie Gorman's page, and it's like frequently Angel asked Fire. questions about you. Yeah, yeah, it's like one of those. This did make me miss him. Like calling. Oh yeah, whole, this one really. I mean, I honestly have kind of. I I missed him for a bit, and then I kind of because he was so gone that I kind of forgot to miss it. But this one, calling a horse a junkie, I felt the twinge. I was like, oh man, yeah. I miss my buddy. That's a classic, and like I do have to say, there is like. There is a guy, you know how we've talked about how every Republican like tries to like replicate Trump's swag? Yeah. And it's just like you just get like this whatever fucking loser from like Missouri or North Dakota who's like trying to be like uh oh, Joe Biden's a washed up psycho. It's like they just, they just don't have it. But there is a new guy. Um Greg Kelly, you know. Oh, he's guy. amazing. Oh, yeah. That guy's amazing. He's, the ball mains. Ball mains. Ball mains. <laughs> he was bragging about wearing like $1,400 ball mains to Mar-a-Lago. Like it's like 2005. And that's like sick. And they were the shittiest pants I've ever seen. I got to say. Like, yeah. I, I, they looked like absolute. Gar- they were cargo pants. Yeah, they were cargo they pants with zippers. $1,500 or something. That's insane. They were like a combination of cargo pants, but then like bondage pants that you wear to like a fucking Deftones concert. And <laughs> it's like, it's so fucking sick. And he also, he did the best uh, major and uh, champ tweet, Biden's tweet, when he called them filthy, disgusting looking dogs. <laughs> that's good. That, yeah, if he wants to be Trump, that's good because he's channeling Trump's obvious loathing of animals. Yes, because yeah. yeah, he thinks they're he thinks they're dirty. Yeah. Wait, I got guys. Hold on, I'm just just seeing now on my Twitter, Kentucky Derby winner Medina Spirit arrested at the Chelsea Hotel following the murder of Prize Mayor uh, Pharaoh's daughter. <laughs> 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 um, did you see though? Did you see guy the the owner of Medina Spirit hitting the the morning talk shows to blame uh, cancel culture for the reason his horse is a junkie? Or the reason yep. his horse his horse is being canceled, don't you see? And yeah, what I love about this is like, r- like racehorse owner guy, uh, like, and this guy's he owns most of like the the big like uh, oh yeah, Bob Baffert. He's the like he's, he's, he's always there, racing. and he's just on TV with this shock of like fucking ivory white hair and sunglasses indoors, and he's just like, <laughs> yeah, take, he looks take like it from me, main, trustworthy he guy. Like the, <laughs> he looks like the main mutant from the Omega Man. <laughs> he should be wearing a black Anthony cloak. Zerby, yeah. And he's got yeah. he's wearing sunglasses indoors to go on Fox yeah. and Friends in the morning to claim that um his horse is being canceled. It, it's you know with all the noise going out out you know we live in a different world now. This this America's different and uh this it was like a cancel culture kind of a a thing so they're reviewing it. <laughs> yeah. And no and his excuse his excuse is great. He said a trainer took cough medicine and urinated in the stable and Medina Spirit ate the hay that uh, one of his groomers had pissed on taking cough medicine and that's what led to the positive test. That's really good. I have there's only one excuse I've ever heard in all the sports that rivals that for a positive test and it was um Pequeno Nogueira who's a Brazilian fighter, he tested positive in a losing effort and then was like, no, no, it's not my fault. So I, my friend made a goat that he gave steroids to. Then he ate the goat? Yeah, I ate the tainted goat. <laughs> <laughs> I just love this guy, like, yeah, ra- racehorse owner, a.k.a. trustworthy individual. Be- yeah, believe he- this guy. But here's the thing, though. Why well, you know they shouldn't be testing for drugs in horse racing? They should let the, they should whack these horses up. Absolutely, it's what already, is, what is like, the idea here? What is the thinking? You, you, know, know, how, you, you know can't how have the horses on drugs because it might encourage other horses who are watching to do drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Winners don't use drugs, but like in in horse racing, like you know how many race horses are just killed when like they oh god yeah get injured or like just can't run anymore they, they just shoot them on the track like yeah more often than i, I, I read this horrible story about uh about donald trump's one attempt to get a racehorse in the 90s oh, god <laughs> he got uh some mob guy who owed him a bunch of money owed a bunch of money to the to the trump taj mahal 
offered to sell him this racehorse that might have in it, it had there had been an infection going around in, in the horse community, and it didn't show any symptoms, but they were worried that if they worked it too hard, uh, it would get sick. And Trump said, "No, fuck, uh, ra- run him! What are you doing? I'm not, oh, I'm not God. paying for him to loaf around eating hay." And sure enough, he got super sick and had to have his front hooves removed. Oh, that's serious. I didn't really? even know that happened to yeah. horses. Uh, I would, and apparently they grow back, which I did not know. Well, they're like the big fingernails, but, but you like can't run race ever again. Yeah, that's like man, that's like the worst person you could give a race horse to. <laughs> oh my god, <gosh>. yeah, <laughs> like he's yeah, he probably just like. The moment he got it, it was like, okay, great. And then just like left it in a parking lot yeah. in Atlantic City for like a year. Yeah. <laughs> Can I leave it, it in the parking garage of a one top, of the, Trump Times One, Mahal? one of the uh, uh, stipulations in his purchase of it is that it was renamed DJ Trump. <laughs> That's, That's... I love him. Okay, like, and, and what I love about Donald <laughs> Trump buying, buying a racehorse is like, you think that there is any possibility that were it on offer, he wouldn't have given that horse drugs to make it run faster? Oh my God! He would have given that horse like Alestra. He would have been like, "It looks fat." <laughs> They're like, uh, if, "If we look, oh, look at those, look at those ankles, honey." Ah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like his trainers, like um, there is a one in two chance that if we inject DJ Trump with uh, liquid plutonium, it'll win the Preakness, and then the other half is that it'll just die immediately, and he'd be like, "It'll explode winners, like it's in a microwave." Winners take big risks, okay? <laughs> If someone had offered to do that for like his sons, he would have done it. What <laughs> for little league? Yeah. For little league, yeah. yeah. He's man, I, I miss him, but like definitely follow Greg Kelly if you miss him. Um, He's the only Greg one doing Ke- Trump style posts that doesn't seem like a sweaty, ham fisted, like you know, awkward copy of the original. Like his brain is yeah. just as warped as Trump's. Like his shit's fried, and like you know what? Like, like he's, he he definitely he's is trying to copy Trump. But in but like it works for him. Yeah, and he's like surpasses him in some ways. Like he adds like a new new type of swag to it. He but that's the thing. You have to have like legitimate like low IQ swag. You can't just be stupid. You have to have like the that type of swag. And that's why like you know, Josh Hawley can't do it because he's he went to Yale and all this shit. That's not the guy he is. He's pretending. But then like, you know, just a true dullard, like uh the governor, uh, Brian Kemp, back when he was like more aping the Trump style. It's like, you don't have it, dude. You're just stupid. You don't have like, you've never had swag. You've never had low IQ confidence. Yeah. It's like you can't have, it's not going to work when you got Ted Cruz going, uh, Graydon Carter was the editor of Vanity Fair, but the real vanity is serving the fair at his bad food restaurant. (laughs) 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 Boo. Ted Cruz, yeah, Ted Cruz, like quoting Churchill when making a speech about how Jill Zarin looks fat. <laughs> it's like it doesn't work. No one believes that guy cares about hairspray. Well, uh, we should uh, probably move on to the other big uh, cultural news of the weekend. And uh, boy, oh boy, am I glad that uh, one third of us has taken it upon himself to watch every single episode of contemporary SNL, like some sort of, <laughs> no. like, I don't know, like, like, like Jesus Christ, kind of, like almost like, kind of, like enduring <laughs> the suffering of the humanity for it, all of it's us. It's not that hard. It's not that big of a deal. It's like, it's an hour. There's a couple of songs. Uh, it, it's not the worst thing on earth. It's just very, very bad. Okay, so Elon Musk hosted SNL this weekend, and it's what everyone's talking about. So we can find, we can now finally employ Matt, Matt Christman SNL report, Elon Musk edition. Matt, how was it? Ah, uh, it was. I mean, it it was terrible, obviously, but they're all bad. And the thing is, is it like Elon Musk hosting? He's not like the regular times that they get a, a, a actor or something like there are different types of SNL hosts. You know, there are former cast members, uh, hosts, there's comedians who will do like a stand up monologue and stuff. And, and then like there are actors who will try to be game. And then they have these sort of freak shows to come on where the novelty is the bit like Donald Trump when he did it or, uh, or Steve Forbes when he did it in 1996. Oh, wow. I, yeah. I remember that actually. Um, and uh 
Elon Musk is in that grand tradition of just no charisma, rich, famous stiffs who come out and just them like trying to do the bits is the joke. Like, oh, it's Elon Musk in a shitty beard. That's what's supposed to be amusing. So what, what were and, some of the highlights? Oh, the highlights, you say. Uh, oh, well, none. low lights, whatever. <laughs> it was, it was, I mean, yeah, the, I would say that uh, the, the things that were most the things that were most risible about it was the were the sketches that like took him seriously, like took his whole bullshit ch- Ponzi scheme, uh, fraudulent ass fake um, futurist thing seriously. Like there was uh, the last sketch of the night was about a, a old West uh, saloon where uh, a, a gang had just shot somebody and went away and they were hiding in the foothills and they wanted to go chase after him with a posse. And then, Elon plays a guy who suggests instead that they dig a tunnel under the ground to get them. And then that they also use uh, a different type of currency except for gold. So it's essentially like, hey, what if Elon Musk was in the, the, the Old West? And at the end, he actually even says, I'm trying to make uh, the Old West into the New West. It actually, it, 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 they, they take him seriously. They're like, this is this guy. It's more advertising for him tunnels leron i thought you was the electric horse guy yeah isn't that yours plugged in outside i do like electric horses and self-driving horses which are just horses (laughs) but i've also built a machine that can dig a tunnel 10 times faster than a gopher i propose that we use it to ambush the pearl river gang (laughs) Uh, and he did do a number of jokes about dogecoin which apparently caused the thing to collapse completely, which is very funny. <laughs> after a lot of people assumed it was going to explode, so he literally, being that, uh, the host of that show, has probably caused at least one person to kill themselves. Which well, that's comedy. probably the first, for, yeah, except uh, for maybe the Sa- Steven Seagal episode. Comedy. Well, that, is that caused the guy who booked him to kill himself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. I uh, when you have a great line like that. Uh, I'm trying to make the Old West the New West. I mean, they probably came up with that first, and then you have to write a sketch around it because you can't just let that die in the writer's room. And, I mean, obviously he's terrible, and and he's terrible in a very obnoxious way because he – I never know – I've never really – I honestly don't think I've ever even really heard him talk before this episode that long. Uh, he does this thing where every time he speaks, his shoulders, like, move. Like, he's he's like – you remember the the dancing Coke can? Where if you clapped or made noise, this mm-hmm. Coke can would like wiggle, it would like hula or something. His his shoulders do that every time he speaks. Like ev- as he's w- speaking, his like he's doing a weird. Chris watched it. Chris, did you notice this? He does this like weird. Uh, yeah, he's he's hula got thing. an intensely awkward physicality, which I guess he would explain by being the first host to ever have uh, Aspergers, though. Uh, that that is uh, uh, Dan untrue. Aykroyd would like a word, sir. Yeah, yes, exactly. exactly. Give me a break. Yeah. Like I was on there for years. Uh, yeah. Well, if you want to talk about Aspergers, has... let's talk about the original screenplay for Ghostbusters. <laughs> <laughs> Matt could fill you in on it. Yes, the Traveler will come in one of the pre-chosen forms during uh, the no, rectification the, of the Valdrani. He has the physicality of Jack Donaghy needing to hold two mugs to walk across the stage. It's very <laughs> like this. Very, it's just awkward. Uh, and they put him in a bunch of beards. They tur- they made him Wario at one point. That's they had him dress up like classic. Wario. And, uh, and Grimes was Princess Peach, right? Oh, that's who that was. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. That was Grimes. They did, she didn't even get a pop from the audience, which is that's got to be embarrassing because usually <laughs> when there's a spe- when someone does a cameo, they get a big audience applause, but nobody knows who the hell that is. There was another one that put him in a Mission Control. Of like his first man mission to Mars, and the joke of that was he was a hyper competent mission control operator of a vast tech enterprise sending a human to Mars, and Pete Davidson was a shithead who fucked everything up on the Martian colony. So again, the 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 but the concept of the joke is that Elon Musk is is essentially correct on all of his exploits, and uh, we the fucked up uh, millennial and Gen Z plebeians is embodied in uh, Pete Davidson are the ones who are are going to die in his uh, uh, grist mill for his experiments. Yeah, that's the main thing that's obnoxious about it is that is that he is the host and all of the jokes, all the sketches are essentially about how he is what he says he is, which I, that's that's great comedy right there. I did see. I mean, it's like if everyone complied with Steven Seagal's ideas. But yes. I, <laughs> I, I, like, I did. I did see one uh, sketch from 
this night. I I didn't see any others. I saw like screenshots, but I watched one entire sketch, and it was <laughs> the one where like all the Zoomers are in the operating room, and they're like, "Yo, my my fam broke his leg, Finna." Yeah, <laughs> it's like, what's the average age of the person writing this show? Like fifty eight. I mean, I don't know. That I think they probably do have some young people in there, and and then they they treat them like. Uh, they like ask them questions and then write it like sort of anthropologically. Yeah. Well, I think like, I mean, there are like good writers who write for that show, but it's like, I think like any good idea they have, they're like, no, actually we're going to get a 63 year old. Yeah. Look to, what happened to fucking to, Tim to, write, to write it. Yeah. To write a sketch called like, you know, rap doctor. Well, that is in their defense. Their target audience. Is yeah. That's like, the thing. It's yeah, like, it's reti- for, retirees. It's for the olds. It's yeah. a legacy media uh, thing. It's a way for older people to process the existence of younger people. It is not for like hip, like gay early twenties people. It's for a seventy-five-year-old woman who is named gay. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, what you're saying, Matt, is that like all of the humor of him hosting and being in sketches was wrung out not from any like dissonance between his public uh, uh perce- like the public perception that he sells to the world and like reality it's like the jokes are like what if he really is just a humble eccentric billionaire who's going to save humanity basically yes and then everybody else is goofing around uh, around him yeah could you imagine what mad tv would have done with this instead? oh my god Gay Elon it, Musk. Yeah, it, it, it wouldn't even be like a satire of like anything that's bad about him. They would just be like, "All right, so Elon, for this sketch, uh, you're a chef, but all you can cook is poop. <laughs> <laughs> you eat poop, and you're naked, and you're a baby." I mean, I feel like it's like it's almost a. Cli- I mean, it, it is a cliche now. So like, it, it, it's almost like annoying to say, but I really do find. Like this certain type of person, and by person I mean guy, who like defends Elon Musk online or like looks up to him like he's some sort of like Da Vinci level genius or, or something is just like it, it's it's the it's the it's it's so gratingly offensive to me because of how like absolutely hollow like like it, it is like I mean it's just like because whenever you press you press any of these people on like Elon Musk or any of the shit he's actually done or or like said they're just like you don't understand. He's trying to save humanity. And I'm like, <laughs> get over yourselves. Like, we are never going to fucking live on Mars, even with or without Elon Musk. Like, get that fantasy out of your fucking head. It'd be nice to think about, but, like, as, as we are currently constituted, get that fucking dream out of your head that we're going to save humanity by colonizing the solar system. It's not going to happen. And it certainly no. isn't going to happen with Elon Musk at the fucking uh, controls. Well, the thing is, though, is if you, if you like most people, have no... If you if you believe that like social cooperation solidarity uh, cannot defeat capitalism and in fact shouldn't defeat capitalism the fa- capitalism even if it has problems and even if it is incompatible with life as we know it is inevitable then the only hope to imagine a future which is impossible under current conditions is to imagine a technological salvation and Elon Musk is now the on paper richest man on earth because he is the avatar of that fantasy future, that, that, that future where we are rescued by technology, where we don't have to confront the contradictions of the systems we live under. And for a lot of people who have given up or never held any hope that we could do anything else, so we could organize our society any other way, then guys like Elon Musk kind of have to be fixated upon and have to be fetishized and have to be patronized because then if you don't believe that they have an idea for a future, that they don't have the capacity to develop some technology that could save us, then there really is no future. And it's hard to live that way. Can I say something that I think is good about Elon Musk? Do it. Please do. So Elon Musk has a very rare tit shape for a man <laughs> that you can only get uh, eating like several different types of like corn-derived products. And I've noticed, like, it's a tit style that you'll see if you watch a lot of movies from the 70s that have a lot of nudity. And it's where, like, they both point outwards. They're, like, pointy, like, triangular ones, and they point outwards. And it's like, well, cool, man. Good good job. (laughs) Triangle tit muscle. Yeah, no, it's not. I've never seen a man have those. 
Like men usually when they like get a little overweight or like are getting old, like he's an older dude. He's like what, like late forties probably. Yeah. Um, you know, one way that that can happen because you know it's it, 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 you get tits when you get old or when you get young. It doesn't matter, but like. There's one style which I call the Irish style, and it's uh, where like you have a big like hard gut, but then your tits are like two popped blisters. <laughs> They're like <laughs> like like flesh sacks, and it's like those nipples wow. are pointing downwards or 45 degree angles, or you can have like sort of like more conical ones to push out, but like pushing like concave like convex ones that's like wild for a man so yeah it's pretty sick i see felix has been stalking my finsta i always suspected that was going on <laughs> but you know i mean shit i'm just trying to put, put myself out there you know for a select few and to have it come back on me in this way is very upsetting i'm sorry but like i okay i think like mine are probably like going to get huge <laughs> Because that that can happen too, where they just you know they're like become luscious, luscious like a woman's breast sometimes. But uh, I think the Irish style, like if you're gonna have them, that's probably the best, right? Because it's you. like you can still no one will notice it if you have a shirt on, and then if you don't have a shirt on, it's like well those aren't like obtrusive; they're not like distracting anyone. Yeah, no one's getting hurt. No one's getting their eyeball poked out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Elon Musk's nipples are probably like weirdly hard. <laughs> like there it's like um when you have like a you know sap on a tree it's probably like the hardened Amber. sap <laughs> yeah well anyway so that's the, that's the musk on SNL report and you know to move on from the world of uh light entertainment and culture i think we should probably now segue into more serious international affairs and you know We'd be remiss if we didn't uh, bring up uh, at least a little bit on this show um, what's the events that are going on in uh, Jerusalem right now, and particularly, you know, like uh, at the Alaska Mosque, and just like, look, we're going to we're you know we, like this is this is a topic that demands like a, a more serious in depth episode, and we do have one in, in the works. But uh, suffice to say, nothing about what's happening on right now should be described as clashes between Israelis and Palestinians. This is straight up full on terrorism and ethnic cleansing being done by Israel to Palestine. And it's coming on the heels of like weeks of fucking far right wing rallies in Jerusalem and throughout Israel, just demanding for the like outright massacre and ethnic cleansing of uh, all Palestinians. You know, the, the ongoing dispossession of just literally people's houses in Jerusalem who like come home from shopping and find some fat asshole sitting in their living room going, call the cops, call the IDF. You know, it's, I live here now. It's mine. Um, I mean, it's just it, and of course, like it, this can't be separated from, you know, Netanyahu's political fortunes. And it's like this is what he's always done is, is stir up some fucking like massive just like you know enabling the 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 you know the right in israeli society i mean i i put i put that in quotation marks because like what isn't the right in israeli society but like that's the thing that they've had like eight elections in the last year and they keep being the exact same tie between two fucking psychos and then they do this shit to try to uh, basically make sure that netanyahu doesn't go to jail by losing the election it's like just yeah. make him god emperor why yeah. are you pretending that this is a fucking democracy? Yeah. I know, I know about the fucking oh, only democracy in the Middle East, but like it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Nothing is being held together by actual uh, consent of the governed anywhere. Just fucking say, uh, you know what, we're in charge, and stop like intentionally provoking and, and causing violence just so that you can keep uh, jiggering around the results of your fake elections. Yeah, this is. I mean, it's definitely Netanyahu trying trying to create create a crisis before so yeah for his political fortunes but it's also like this is also who they are at the end of the day yeah. this, I mean, this is what is this policy. country is yeah. this is this is the country that does crystal knocked every fucking day this is you know let's not mince words here this is the fucking fourth reich it, it's it's not just idf shooting and killing people in el Aqsa, which is something you know only satan himself would do if he had dominion over that land it's just random Israelis just freaking out and hitting Palestinian children with their car, completely backed up by the fucking state. Things like this every fucking day. We, um, yeah, we do have a really great guest lined up to talk about this more in depth because it deserves that attention. Uh, but 
Yeah. Um, there's something related to this. I'm going to talk about it at the end of the show. But like, for now, uh, something you can do, because I think what they want Americans to feel like is uh, if they don't outright approve of this is just helpless. What can I do? What can I, what can I say? And just be a nerd to it. But I, I, there's a lot you can do. Uh, there are charities like uh, Islamic Relief for Canada who provides medical relief and aid for people on the ground in Palestine. Um, there's um, Al Quds uh, network that like provides resources for Palestinian communities. Uh, there's a ton of stuff, and we can put that in the link description. But yeah, this is this is wholly indefensible. But this is the real face of Israel and the real I'm, face of Zionism. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it should go without saying that this demands like the at the very least the sternest possible condemnation from the U.S. government and the rest of the world community. I mean, I won't be holding my fucking breath. But, like, yeah, like, th this is just the face of Israeli policy and Israeli culture, like, of their democracy. Like, this is what their democracy means. This is what it's set up to do. But, like, to the extent that this is, you know, like, Netanyahu, uh, you're creating a crisis to cause violence, to enable him to, like, you know, get over the line for the 12th time in a row in the last three years and, like, form a government or, like, and avoid prosecution for when he's out of office. So all I got to say for Netanyahu and Israeli society as a whole, I hope they get their wish and get it hard. Yeah. <clears throat> Moving on to another election, um, got, like, I... I have followed so little of this because, you know, our official policy on the show now is that um, it, <laughs> ignore all English posts, ignore all English news <laughs> stories, ignore all, all news coming out of that island. But man, oh man, has Kier Starmer, has there ever been a more born to lose man alive than this guy? He's owning. That's what He's... they fucking hired him to do. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's great. I mean, God, talk about another group of people who deserve to get everything that's coming to them, and it's the British Labor Party. Yeah, you guys got what you wanted. You stopped Corbyn. Enjoy. They are. They're loving it. They are it. enjoying it. They love it. It's great. They don't. They don't have to win. What the point? What's the point of the winning? You still get. You, you get the, the the paycheck clears regardless. Yeah. Uh, Kier has been. I think Kier hired somebody who uh, worked for Pete. Because did you see what he, when they were like, uh, Sir Keith, you you know lost the most seats, this is the worst anyone's ever done, and he was like, we're gonna look to challenges in the future to better ascertain how to come across them. No, they it's said like, they said they said what, what change what, what changes are you gonna implement? And he's like, we're looking very strongly at implementing the changes that will make change. Yeah. Oh, um, I sub uh. uh, uh an Iranian uh, listener told me this. Kier means cock in Persian. There we go. You, I mean, I don't know if that's an asset or uh, a liability for him, but it's like he's got to do something here. He's yeah. got like, I mean, he he like he doesn't give a shit. I guess. But no. Like no, he is. Born if they want to keep, lose. yeah. If they want to keep up the appearance that they're at least trying, but yeah, no. <laughs> They uh, they are promoting Jess Phillips and <laughs> like other people who just fucking sabotage the shit out of Corbin, and this will keep happening worse and worse. I mean, like it is, it, it's amazing like how indefensible the, the job they did is because it's like, yeah, that I don't think you have a better case for Boris Johnson's incompetence than what is right behind you the time frame that's right behind you and it's just like no we're gonna do even worse and the thing is like they they, they couldn't capitalize at all on the fact that like boris johnson and the tories management of like the pandemic has been so fucking bad and like they couldn't they couldn't even they they did worse than the fucking last time like it, it's just yeah it's astonishing they lost they lost the crumpet upon buttockshire council <laughs> for the first time in 60 years it's a fucking shambles the only labor candidates that did win were people who were like either Corbyn loyalists or just like out and out about socialist policies and like, ran on like, the same strategy that they ran in 2017. And the people that lost were the, you know, l labor means uh, you can have a Polish slave again. <laughs> It's, I mean, yeah, no, I think there's like some a momentum Corbyn candidate won in Wales for the first time in like a hundred years. So Wales, yeah. Scotland, get out while the getting's good. I England, mean, that it might happen. England, there's apparently, no one of the other things there. that happened in the election is that the SNP did better than they've ever done. So, <laughs> shocker, they, they, they want out. I mean, I understand. I, I, I also have to say, 
big ups to the Northern Independence Party and that movement. Uh, you, uh, your fortunes lie elsewhere than as part of the UK under yeah. the just chop under that the fucker up. Let, let's just go into a. Uh, I, everything's going to fall apart eventually. Let's do it quickly while you can like do some fun stuff in the interim. Bring just back yeah. the Kingdom of Northumbria. Exactly. Yeah. Create the. Bring back the Septarchy or whatever the fuck. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> bring I mean, back the. Bring. Bring forth the Greg's Empire. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like I understand the UK has uh, national. Uh, has, they have health insurance over there, which is like nothing to sniff at. And by the way, they won't for much longer. Yeah. Not for, <laughs> with these not with these long. fucking yeah. flunkies in charge, they will not have the NHS for much longer. They they will have dynamic American style healthcare sometime in the near future. Which is guess what? What you all wanted, and it's what you all fucking deserve. Health healthcare I mean, the, for the time being aside, though. It is nice to just have one comparable democracy in the world that is more doomed and hopeless than America, and that's the UK. Yeah, I do. I mean, it's not just health. Like, the NHS is the ideal system. It's, like, better than Medicare for all. Like, it's just fully nationalized medicine, which I think the goal should be. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, no, I mean, we'll see. we'll see what it looks like when Boris is done with it. Well, I mean, uh, and, and, and then like in the, in the postmortems of this, there, of course, everybody is just blaming Corbin for this. I saw this one lady. He was he was like, I, I compare labor's performance in, in this election to a beloved footballer who had an injury and then was pushed out too early before they had recovered. They're in no, but they're in no way match ready to take the pitch. And it's like <laughs> you've had a fucking year where he's been like in the dirt and it's still his fault. It's it's still his yeah. fault to them because oh, like oh yeah he did so much damage to them by making them for the first time ever like electorally viable even close to that and uh, they're never going to forgive him for that and again like everything else you got what you asked for enjoy yeah. well and, and it's like they can't even pull this shit because they were saying you know they were saying like oh um you know campaign meetings going great no one's even mentioned Jeremy Corbyn during like during our canvases it's like. You can't have it both ways. But, you know, the Jess Phillips of the world, they will be further promoted and uh, the Corbyn people will be further buried, no matter if they're the only ones who win or not. What's the, isn't there some rumor about her having an affair with Keir Starmer? Or is that someone else? No, no, that's not Jess Phillips. Uh, it's a Top Starmer aide, but it's very funny. It's like she was banned from his house by order of his wife or something like that. Someone tweeted and deleted that. Yeah, let me let me try to find uh, Tim Shippers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite fish and chips chain in Lower Saxonburgy. <laughs> I love going to Tim Shippers. Uh, let me see exactly who it is. Uh, I'm really afraid. I don't want to get it wrong. I'm really afraid of uh, getting uh, banned from the UK. Jenny Chapman, Dwayne, uh, Dwayne Chapman, Dwayne Dog Chapman's daughter. <laughs> yeah, well, they look like brother and sister, so maybe they are having an affair. <laughs> they do love that. Yeah. In the UK. Well, moving on from uh, one election that's just now recently over to one that's been over for a while now. And look, uh, I bring this up, uh, I bring up this article, and it may seem like, oh, this is just. Uh, you know, old material, rehashing old beefs for, you know, the same audience. But you know what? I am simply a petty bitch who loves drama. So I will now share with you guys the most recent profile of Elizabeth Warren in Politico. Because wouldn't you know it, all, all our old favorites and hits are there. And Elizabeth Warren has a lot of thoughts about her 2020 run for presidency that I think you may be interested in listening to. So gentlemen, I give you... Warren says she will run for re-election in 2024. This comes courtesy yes. of Politico. And this is about a new book Elizabeth Warren has coming out about simply about her run for the presidency. Uh, the 71-year-old senator whose new book addresses the disappointment of her failed presidential campaign says she sees a future in the Senate. Not if Dave Portnoy has anything to say about it. <laughs> yeah. No, Dave is... He's the prince that was promised. Yeah, Dave is rolling. Fuck Kevin Clancy, couldn't leave it alone. Now I gotta remind you who sits on the Iron Throne. Is that gold? He doesn't even know it yet that he's going to be senator, but he is going to be. Okay, so it says here, in a move that may surprise some, 
ambitious Massachusetts Democrat Senator Elizabeth Warren says that she's going to run for re-election in 2024. It will only surprise some in so much as usually when you finish third in your home state as a senator, you uh, don't seek re-election. You can but I commit s- fucking seppuku <laughs> if you have any but, honor. I mean, are, are, the, is any, are any of you guys surprised she's going to run for re-election in the Senate? Not at all. No, I right? am not. What else yeah. are you going to do? Yeah. What else does she have going on? <laughs> That's where old losers is to hang out. Yep. The 71-year-old said simply in a Politico interview Friday when asked if she is planning to make the run. The answer came as some Massachusetts Democrats have been gaming out a competitive primary in a few years that could include figures like Representative Ayanna Presley and former Representative Joe Kennedy III. Two well-connected Bay State Democrats said in interviews that they still wonder if Warren might change her mind in the end. After, a, after all, Warren did spend the past two years trying to leave the Senate, the presidential campaign, her auditioning to be vice president, and then the push to be Biden's Treasury Secretary. <laughs> they don't mention racking I mean, up wins. They have not yet mentioned her losing her home state in the primary, which I'm I'm shocked by. The failure of those recent efforts seems to weigh heavily on those uh, on Warren these days, who addresses some of her disappointments in her new book, Persist. Uh, oh, persist. She needs new material. Yeah, no, she's been doing the same thing literally for like five years now. Um, she did. I mean, like, she should roll with what she was doing during the primary that she like immediately dropped after. Where she was like, she was like acting like an NYU student. <laughs> it's like we're 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 ha- we're having bipox and liminal spaces. We need to start savings accounts for POC mamas. <laughs> like she's putting X's and everything, even though she's like seventy three. And then just immediately dropped it when she lost. Like, she should write a whole book like that. That was awesome. I think Persist is a great title for a book that is just basically, would you like to hear about my litany of failure? Yeah. I just keep yeah. trying. I do not take a hint. Yeah. Uh, the, the, rem- yeah. The book is Warren's attempt to grapple with a difficult couple of years while defending some of the positions put forth during her presidential campaign. The book has a confessional tone, and it comes at a time when many people in the Democratic Party, including some Warren supporters, believe she's at a political crossroads. In 2012, I was new to politics. In 2020, I was new to losing, she writes in the book. She makes self-deprecating references to her defeat at multiple points in the book. I didn't win the presidency, of course. Damn, I'd lost. And no, I didn't win. I hadn't won my fight. I laid out my plans and fought as hard as I knew how. And All I those lost. plans! <laughs> and no I'm one lost. cared about my plans! No, no use crying over spilled plans. <laughs> the acknowledgments are not immune either. Campaigns are hard. Losing campaigns are even harder, she writes, while thanking various friends and aides. But asked if she'd do anything differently, Warren says, not really. Well, I like this, like, this, this is all like, oh, God, losing is such a bitter pill. Like, she was, like, you know, beaten by a buzzer beater shot at the last fucking moments yeah, of the she game got or whatever. Owned. She got washed out immediately. <laughs> immediately. It was never close. So, like, it's, it's not like she, she had a, a taste of the apple. There was, like, a month where she was her. polling okay. She was polling, like, first, like, five months before a primary. And, and I think when that happened... Her brain short circuited, and then she was unable to accept everything that came afterwards. Because to her, that was the natural, that was the natural resting place of her popularity, not a mirage. Does that mean that she thinks that there wasn't ever a path to victory? Look, we know the outcome, but I didn't make it. I know that she said in an interview via Zoom, wearing a light brown zip-up hoodie. In the book, she admits to making some strategic mistakes. I was wrong to take the test, she writes, of the DNA test she took to settle questions about her past claims of Native American ancestry. Uh, is it, were you wrong to take the test, Elizabeth, or were you wrong to have made this claim for most of your adult life? That, that, that to me, seems to be the bigger error strategically on your part. Doing the fucking cookbook, for example. How is that? And she mentions other factors that hurt her, but doesn't hone on a single thing. She notes that she never recovered from the Medicare for All debate and the headwind of trying to be the first woman president. So far as I know, no one ever asked the men in the 2020 race if they felt they were treated differently because they were men. She says that both Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden had bases of loyal supporters that made it hard for any other candidate to break through in the race. Warren also writes, there's always another possibility, a much more painful one. In this moment, 
Maybe I just wasn't good enough. Mm, nah, that can't be it. Warren's defeat has been followed by other changes that have left her trying to find a path forward. Many of her longtime staffers have moved on, some, trying, some to join the Biden administration, and there are many new faces in her office. By virtue of coming in second in the presidential primary and his perch atop the budget committee, Sanders has emerged as the leading progressive in the Senate. If Biden runs for re-election, as he said he expects to, the window for another White House run wouldn't open until 2028, when she'll turn 79. Warren's book is the latest evidence that even as Democrats control the White House and Congress, there are lingering divisions stemming from the 2020 primary, particularly among progressives. The strong candidacies of both Warren and Sanders fueled the hopes of progressives for one of their own to lead the party. No, 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 no. You just spent the last four paragraphs laying out just her saying over and over again, I wasn't good enough. I failed. We lost. I have to come to terms to that. Both of them did not have strong campaigns. Sanders had a strong campaign. It wasn't good enough. He lost. But at least you could say he put up a good show. Warren did not win a single state. This whole, this whole tragedy about her losing. She ate shit. No one this, cared. This whole tragedy about her losing and how bad she feels about it. It's just like, like why even feel bad about it? You, like, you, didn't, you didn't even come close. It was, not, it was not a strong campaign that you ran, Elizabeth. People are still mad, rightfully so, for her not endorsing Bernie and all that stuff. But for one thing, she was never going to do that because that wasn't her role. And two, even if every one of her supporters had gone to Bernie, it probably would not have been close to enough because there weren't any. She, yeah, no, that's the she thing. Appeals, she appeals to young people who made it. And there are basically none of those in this country. There are no young people who have made it. And that is, that is the people who voted for her, which is why she got such a fucking dismal showing. Because... Uh the current state of the relationship between Sanders and Warren seems to be more cordial than warm. Bernie and I are friends and we're doing great, Warren said in her Politico interview while declining to elaborate. Tensions between the two flared up in Iowa just weeks before last year's caucuses when Warren confronted Sanders after a debate about his denial of her claim that he told her he didn't believe a woman could defeat Donald Trump. I think you called me a liar on national TV, she said. You called me a liar, he shot back. Behind the scenes, however, the feud had been escalating for months, and the bitterness has only been partly revealed. In September 2019, when Warren was at her peak in the polls, she called Sanders personally and told him that she felt his people, staffers included, were being increasingly toxic and attacking her. Sanders disputed that and retorted that her people were also going after him, according to someone familiar with the dispute. I'm not going there. I'm not looking back, Warren said in her Politico interview. I mean, that's funny because like the whole concept of your book is that you're looking back on your presidential run and why it failed. And like this is this is the area that you don't think is worthy delving into. Like like for instance, that completely kayfabe moment at the debate where he's like, Oh yeah, it's like, ah, well, what are you doing, Bernie? Uh, her book acknowledgments include a subtle reference, however, to her frustration with Sanders staff. Speaking of her, former, of her former campaign team, she writes that you showed that it's possible to be respectful and friendly to those who are working for rival campaigns. What a load of horse shit. I mean, can, can, can anyone take this shit from this woman? Uh, that sounds like you're not being respectful of an opponent, and I'm disappointed to see it, honestly. I mean, no wonder you lost. You're running a fucking campaign. It's like you, the, the people you're running against are your enemies in this competition. Sorry, they couldn't, you can all be friends. Uh, Warren doesn't mention the fallout with Sanders much in her book. I mean, a, what a shock. But the divisions between them remain clear. Warren writes with the passive voice that, quote, it leaked that Bernie had told me that a woman couldn't win. Can you? <laughs> what a way to say that. It, it, uh, things happened. It had leaked that he said this thing and that I simply An just officer to involved to leak it. right there. Yeah, yeah, nice nice yeah, passive exactly. voice. Sanders denied that at the time. It is ludicrous to believe that at the same meeting where Elizabeth Warren told me she was going to run for president, I would tell her that a woman couldn't win, he said. What I did say that night was that Donald Trump is a sexist, a racist, and a liar who would weaponize whatever he could. His office did not immediately respond for comment. Soon after the debate clash, liberal representative uh, Pramila Jayapal announced that she would endorse Sanders over Warren. Jayapal later told others that she felt Warren had questioned her feminism when she called the Massachusetts senator to explain her decision, according to a person Jayapal told at the time. Jayapal's office declined to comment. This is my, no, this, this is my favorite quote from her. Warren addresses other campaign controversies in the book on the creation of the $14 million super PAC that kept her afloat after Sanders outpaced her in initial contests. Warren writes that 
a stunningly generous woman put $14 million into a super PAC. Yeah, that, that just happened. She was so stunningly generous to you, Elizabeth. And also, like, doesn't bring up the fact that this was, like, specifically the thing Warren was campaigning against, that she declaimed that she would ever have a super PAC, uh, you know, fund her campaign. And then she was like, oh, all of a sudden, after she gets fucking wrecked in the first three primaries and just, like, just nosedives, like fucking Pete Buttigieg and, and Amy Klobuchar did better than her, she just all of a sudden, out of nowhere... A stunningly generous person gives her $14 million only to stay in the race through Super Tuesday. I, it was a stunning act of generosity on that woman's behalf. Former Sanders officials remain angry that Warren didn't endorse Sanders after she dropped out because of their shared progressive values. Asked in an interview why she initially chose not to endorse any candidate after she withdrew, Warren sighed and gave an uncharacteristically slow, halting answer. There were a few more states to vote, she said. I knew I wanted to wait until there was just one person in the race and get 100% behind that person. Yeah, she wanted to uh, make sure that she could possibly be Treasury Secretary for Joe Biden, which worked out great for her. I mean, like, it's hard for me to even, like, really get mad at her anymore. I mean, yes, she did, like, go out of her way to try to sabotage Sanders, but... Um, Had she gone really out of her way to help that's him? Not Right, but that's not really the reason the campaign yeah. lost. Like, it's the campaign could have been run better. Uh, but uh, like, if Elizabeth Warren could stop you, that's uh, yeah. a bad commentary. But she did, she did harm it. Uh, she did show herself to be like a very awful, conniving person. Um, but the nice thing is, she's a pure footnote now. That's no one true. gives a shit about her. Yeah. No one talks about her. All the people that you know she paid to support her, basically, uh, they're they've moved on. Everyone's moved on, and here she is. Yeah, even the people you who don't got hear about head. her plans anymore. You don't have even, to pretend that that's that means something. It's 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 nice. Even the people who got the hex code tattoos have already moved on. They don't care about yeah. this shit anymore. Yeah, no, they're just telling people they were in the Holocaust. <laughs> <laughs> no, this I was in Dachau. <laughs> It goes, it goes on to say, it's ironic that that person ended up being Biden. Warren's political career began in part because Biden supported a reform of the bankruptcy code that she long fought against. Quote, Joe Biden was on the side of the credit card company, she said in 2019. In some ways, her career was defined by being a non-Biden type of Democrat. But Biden's presidency has been a pleasant surprise for progressives, including Warren. In the interview, Warren explains Biden's evolution as him meeting the moment. 20 years ago, we hadn't had a pandemic. 20 years ago, we didn't have Donald Trump, she said, referring to their dispute over the bankruptcy code. Uh, yeah, 20, 30 years ago, they had another pandemic. Uh, it was called AIDS, and that's when you were voting for Reagan, Liz. Sorry, honey. Bye-bye. Yeah. And um, also today, Joe Biden uh, did a press conference where he said, anyone who is able to get a job and still collects unemployment will be kicked off unemployment. Yeah. They're at, oh, uh, what is this? Oh, no. They're, they're leveraging their market... Uh situation to uh, increase their uh, pay nope not gonna happen not well J sheriff joe's in charge get yeah, back to work peasants for fucking pay pennies yeah he's learned and grown a lot yeah it took Warren what did it take it took like it took two op-eds and some fucking viral uh, pictures most of which are probably fake of of signs at like a uh, drive through saying we don't have any workers for these people to just crack the fucking whip to make sure that uh, all the leverage you might have to get a better fucking deal from these Draculas is gone. Activist government at its finest. Warren's plans-based approach enthralled many, <laughs> college enthralled many college educated voters, but did not catch on with much of the Democratic base. Weird. <laughs> <laughs> Warren's dork-ass nerd bullshit uh, appealed to dork-ass nerds, but somehow didn't appeal beyond that group. Weird. She still feels releasing the 81 plans was the right thing to do, but wrestles with why voters didn't reward her. I often wondered why other candidates didn't have detailed plans for the future, she writes in her book. Maybe the more puzzling question is why people running for office so rarely campaign on plans and why that's apparently OK with millions of voters. <laughs> I mean, that's, that says it all right there, right? I mean, because A, it's like uh, none of these plans matter anyway. 
And like, it's like it, 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 your, your plans are just you're just saying what I believe in. Like, it, like voters don't really care, like, you know, what, what, how you're going to fund it or like, you know, it, like laying it out point by point because no one's going to read that shit. No one even understands it. They just heard you say I'm for Medicare for all. And then as the prime and the voting actually, you know, got closer and closer, you found a way to say you weren't for it. Yeah. She, she, she goes, she acknowledges that politics can be tricky. Plans force us to make choices, but also create targets, which we then have to defend, she writes. Pressed on whether she thinks detailed plans are bad politics, she said in the interview, I don't think so. Oh, my God. Uh, it, who gives a shit about the plans, lady? She That's not. That is, good Lord. The plans are over. Like Joe Biden. What was his plan? Can you imagine him having a plan? Do I really look like a guy with a plan? You know what I am? I'm a dog chasing cars. I wouldn't know what to do with one if I caught it. Curing cancer, get a milkshake. Yeah, that's it. He just says that. He <laughs> yeah. just says, folks, yeah. cancer, it's done. Being so old that he like forgets he's pro austerity and then remembers again pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah, because it's written on his body like in fucking yeah. memento. Yeah. It's yeah, it's like don't don't listen to this man's lies, and it's like a single mother. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, asked about Donilon's theory of the case that voters prefer values to ideology, she pushed back. I don't think there's a tension between having good, solid, detailed plans and values, she said. The plans are the physical manifestation of those values. She warns in the book that the consequences of not having good plans will be catastrophic. I write knowing with absolute certainty that if we fail to make major changes, we will plunge our nation and our planet into an abyss from which we cannot escape. That's the last line of the profile. <laughs> I just love the idea. It's like, we are on the verge of plunging into an abyss from which there is no return. The only thing standing in our way is from the, preventing that awful future from happening is this like Sarah Connor figure, in Elizabeth Warren. We're with a if, fucking manila envelope. Wow. If only full of plans. Had, if only we had voted for her when she had the chance. And you know what? You know, I understand, like, I, I sort of agree with Felix. Like, I'm still obviously very salty about her behavior in the primaries. But, like, with, you know, with the lens of hindsight, I think it was just like, you know, we, like everyone else, it probably made too big a deal of it at the time because, like, as cowardly and hypocritical as her behavior was, like, her endorsement or, like, her doing the right thing yeah, wouldn't have made it wasn't a difference move in the, the end anyway. Like, it wasn't going to no. move the needle. Cause, and, like, and also, most of her supporters weren't going to vote for Bernie anyway. To the extent that they existed nope. at all, uh -uh. outside of a few college towns and like you know various states in America, like it just it wouldn't have made a difference. It was never going to work for her, and it was never probably never going to work for Bernie either. I mean, the way the campaign was run, or just just the, the, the factors as they laid well, out, and, and the fact that that politics is a spectacle that the people who needed to, who Bernie needed to have disengaged from, and that that means that at a certain level, any amount of campaigning in the traditional sense is going to be. Uh, falling on deaf ears. And I don't think that that's something that, I mean, I certainly didn't understand just how deeply that had set in. And, and uh, they certainly didn't act like they did. Yeah, I guess just, you know, for whatever it's worth at the end of the day, which is not much, I mean, there's a reason Bernie is like the elder statesman of the in the Democratic Party right now, and Elizabeth Warren is a complete afterthought. <laughs> yeah, and if anyone's going to stop, like, this current Bi Biden austerity demon welfare reform replication or any other shitty things that he's planning to doing or that he is not formulated yet, it will be Bernie and it will not be Liz. If anyone Bye, -bye honey. Is, yeah, if anyone's good at curbing Biden's worst, some of his worst excesses, because let's be honest, there is a limit. Uh, yeah. We know who it's going to be. Yeah, we're at, we're at the harm mitigation level here. Uh, do you guys want to do uh, one more quick reading series? Give the people, give, give the hogs a little something extra today. You know, yeah, we're at, we're at an hour now. You know, we've, we've been going, we've been super sized last time. I mean, th this fits into what we were just talking about in terms of like uh, the Biden, um, like uh, like job search requirements for unemployment insurance, and like you know, crack the way in which like now as, as things begin to call thaw coming out of COVID. The way in which you know, like uh, capital and and and, and you know, management is beginning to crack the whip to like sort of uh, instill and like sort of to reinstill a discipline in a restive workforce that is out of work. And as Matt said, probably at, at no point in recent memory has more a stronger hand to play in terms of like, you know, what 
what they can get to demand to like open everything back up again. Like if we want to get back to a normal economy, maybe a lot of people are asking the question, well, if you're asking me to go back to work or potentially like put my health or my family's health at risk, you know, what are you giving me in return? And if the answer is the same fucking shitty minimum wage and awful workplace conditions, I, yeah, fuck it. Like I'm taking unemployment. Fuck this. Fuck working at some shitty bar and grill in the middle of Missouri that sells bad food and makes everyone sick. Fuck working at a Lauren Boebert's diarrhea factory. Uh, if I can avoid <laughs> doing it. But this is a, this is from this is a this is a this is an op-ed piece that was in the Washington Post, and uh, I think it's a very very telling example of like uh, yeah CEO mindset and like and how they're dealing with a, a you know a, a workforce that has become like due to COVID largely due to like the accident of like a global emergency has shall we say uh, become used to certain things that like, you know, management would like to make everyone forget exist. Like for instance, if you have an office job, everyone over the last year or so has realized that there is absolutely no point in having an office to do any of these fucking jobs. Like you know, it, it just propping up the commercial real estate industry is basically all the, the only function an office serves as best I can tell. So here we go. This is courtesy of the Washington Post. As a CEO, I worry about the erosion of office culture with more remote work. This is by Kathy Merrill. And it says, Kathy Merrill is chief executive of Washingtonian Media. She writes here, like many of my fellow small business owners, I am excited about the prospect of returning to in-person work, but I'm struggling with when and how to safely reopen our office, how many days a week, vaccination requirements, masks mandates, and so on. But also, like my peers, I'm concerned about the unfortunately common office worker who wants to continue working at home and just go into the office on occasion. In several group calls with chief executives, I've found a great sense of pride in how well our teams have done during the past year. However, we all started at a place where we and our employees knew one another, which made remote work considerably easier and more productive. We could also rely on office cultures, established practices, unspoken rules, and shared values established over years in large part by people interacting in person. Now, we face recreating a workplace where a good culture of trust will be harder to build. Do you think that good culture of trust is harder to build because people are, uh, haven't been to the office or because of what a shitty boss you are? Well, being away from the office gives you a chance to reflect on how shitty your boss is. Exactly. Like, wow, like, I, I, there's this weird like, sense of doom over my head and it's gone now. What happened? What was that? Weird. And you know, also like, especially when it comes to like remote work, and if you're talking about the uh, the, the sort of demographic of, of employees that we're talking about who have like you know white collar professional jobs and professional or like the creative knowledge based economy, whatever you want to call it. I mean, like the other thing is like what working from home has really underscored is that like when you're not going to an office, like if, if you're sitting in an office all day, you can lie to yourself that like you're like pff, pff, not another nine to five, another long day at the office working. But when you're doing the same tasks at home in your underwear looking at your laptop, you realize that you weren't actually working at the office either. Like most people, like for an eight hour workday, have at most three to two to three hours of actual work to accomplish of a day. And the rest of it is most, like I said, fulfilling this pantomime of like playing dress up and going to it. Like it's like Richard Scarry's busy town. You know, you play dress up and you go to a place where the work happens and you feel like you've been hard at work all day when really you've just been like, you know, staring at a computer screen, pretending to look busy. Uh, what, one of the biggest issues we talk about is an apparent age gap. Well, uh oh, the CEOs have discovered age gap discourse, folks. Let's see where this goes. Anecdotally, I've heard from many CEOs that are older, more senior employees working from comfortable homes and happy to be relieved of commuting are more reluctant to go back to the office than their younger colleagues, many of whom who have been working from small apartments or their parents' homes. Some research supports that. Commercial real estate firm Cushman and Wakefield reported last year that 70% of millennial and Gen X workers struggle more with the challenges of working from home. And consulting firm PwC found that fewer than one in five executives wanted to return to the shared workplace as it was before the pandemic. See, that surprises me that it's like the younger workers who want to go back to the office more. I mean, I thought like I would just expect as a whole younger workers or, you know, worse employees and by worse employees i mean that like they care about their life outside of the job i think they want to be adults so they want to be like grown-ups and they want being on a computer is what they did in school they want to go outside they want to go with their little outfit and and have a uh have a chopped salad 
and and enjoy a Panera bread and talk adul- about uh, <laughs> television programs. They want to they want to like do a little adult adulting like a boss. They want to get a delicious nutrition bowl every day from yes. one of the many fine chain eateries of Midtown Manhattan. Mm-hmm. It says here for business owners, this disparity poses a real problem. As the economy rebounds, we need to hire and attract talent. To do so, we will need le- we will need leaders on site. Consider the son of a friend of mine, a young investment banker who was courted by two firms last fall. One said that his employees wouldn't be back in their offices for at least a year. The other said that theirs would be back as soon as it felt safe. He picked the latter. He didn't want to spend another year working remotely. Most importantly, he wanted to be around a brain trust of more senior people whom he could learn from and connect with. How will we persuade new employees to come aboard and more importantly stay if they don't have leaders they can build a solid in-person relationship to? Um, I don't know. You could you could pay them a salary that, that makes all the bullshit seem at least worth at least at least like if you're if you pay them enough like the brutal the awful dehumanizing aspects of a workplace you can at least feel in your checking account when you get that direct deposit hit you're like okay ah uh, this is why I'm doing it but you know I mean if you're if if there if there's no there's no talk here about like benefits or salary or whatever I don't know what the fuck you're talking about lady well I mean, that like, that's the that's the most important thing on the job is a leader it's someone who's 63 years old makes five to six times what you make, um, dyes his hair kind of like a chestnut red color, uh, dropped out of college because he was playing too much bridge, um, needs you to like use the printer and even like really turn on his computer. A leader. A mentor. Yeah. While some employees might like to continue to work from home and pop in only when necessary, that presents executives with a tempting economic option the employees might not like. I estimate that about 20% of every office job is outside one's core responsibilities. Extra. It involves helping a colleague, mentoring more junior people, celebrating someone's birthday, things that drive office culture. If the employee is rarely around to participate in those extras, management has a strong incentive to change their status to contractor. Instead of receiving a set salary, contractors are paid only for the work they do, either hourly or by appropriate output metrics. That would mean not having to pay, t- uh, pay for health care, a 401k match, or our share of FICA and Medicare taxes. Benefits that, in my company's case, add up to roughly an extra 15% of compensation, not to mention the potential savings of reduced office space and extras such as bonuses and parking fees. So yeah, that, uh, that extra 15% and uh, your 401k and health care, uh, that's for attending uh, uh, <laughs> office birthday parties and uh, buying bagels every other week. But like you, you see here, like the I mean, she says here like, oh, this is like a mm, this may this, this may lead us to consider an option that some employees may not like. I mean, like it's not hard to discern the threat here. Right. Like I said about like reinstilling discipline is like, oh, like, you know, uh, nice expectations you have about the workplace. It would be a shame if someone took away your health care benefits and salary. Because I mean, well, look, you look, know, sometimes people got to know who's in charge. But the point is, like, making everyone a contractor or like a gig employee—that's what they want to do, regardless of whether you go to the office or not. Like right now, they're using like come if to they the can't, office, uh, completely outsource it, which would be the ideal. And with a lot of these, uh, I mean, I would that would be what my threat is. Like, look, if you're not coming into office, why does this have to happen in the United States at all? Good point. Furthermore, we need feedback good and bad, to successfully manage employees, and they need it to succeed. A friend at a Fortune 500 company tells of a colleague who was hired just as the pandemic hit. He struggled. He wasn't getting the job done. It was very hard for the leadership team to tell what the problem was. Was it because he was new? Was he not up to the work? What was the specific issue? Worse, no one wanted to give him feedback over Zoom when they hadn't even met him. Professional development is hard to do remotely. People considering just dropping into their office should also think about FOMO, fear of missing out. Those who work from home probably don't have FOMO. They will just have MO. They'll just have MO. The casual meetings that take place during the workday. The do you have three minutes to discuss X? These encounters will happen. Information will be shared. Decisions will be made. Maybe if you're at home, you'll be zoomed in, but probably not. As one CEO put it, there is no such thing as a three-minute Zoom. Being out of that informal loop is likely to make you a less valuable employee. I mean, that's the thing. FOMO, fear of missing out. There will be no more office affairs if we all just go remote. Uh, in, it, unless they're like just gross, like jacking off on your computer. <laughs> unless you're Jeffrey Tubin. Like, like, yeah, like chat relay stuff, which is just depressing. 
Last paragraph here. While remote working is certainly industry and job dependent, and the future employment scene will probably be some type of hybrid, the CEOs I've spoken with fear erosion of collaboration, creativity, and culture. Uh, So although there might be some pains and anxiety going back into the office, the biggest benefit for workers may be simple job security. Remember something every manager knows. The hardest people to let go are the ones you know. So, So there you go. You have to stop by the office. You got to glad hand a little bit or else you'll be your head will be the first on the chopping block because that's what that's what leaders, mentors, CEOs and your managers want from you, a personal connection. So that when it comes time to cut your salary or fire you, they'll think twice. And that personal connection can only be cultivated with stealing people's lunch out of the refrigerator. That's what offices are all about. That does sound like the one thing that would have been fun. Who I burned like popcorn? Just try whole... somebody else's sandwich every day. See Someone... who's uh, who makes the best uh, like club or something. Just just sampling. The whole office has popcorn lung because Will put a bag of pop secret in there for eight minutes. <laughs> so it's not a fire drill. It's another popcorn disaster. This is what working in an office is like. There'll be no fire drills. No office fairs. Um, no annoying person with halitosis leaning over your computer asking you if you saw the, if you watched the game last night or something like that. So there you go. Uh, more, more work, more sort of management discipline of a restive workforce. Uh, there, there's a, there are carrots and sticks out there. The stick is uh, making you a full time contractor. The carrot is um, uh, pizza party Thursdays. So what do you think, guys? Think that about does it for today? Yeah, I'll do. That wraps it up. Okay. Oh, uh, oh wait. Yeah, right. we, we got a few plug time. Plug. We got plugs. We got, plug. yeah, we got two plugs. Yeah, yeah. Double plugs. So, so everyone's heard me uh, delve into my obsession with the From Software franchises: the Bloodborne, Dark Souls, Demon Souls, Sekiro. Uh, but you've only seen me play Sekiro, not a true Soulsborne game. So uh, this Saturday, I will be doing a fundraiser stream where I play my favorite FromSoft games. And you will see, have I been lying about playing these the entire time? Have I never played them? Am I too afraid of the monsters within them to play them? Will I just run away and my camera will just uh, be stuck on a door for 14 hours? Well, we'll find out. But we will be raising money for Movement to Safeguard Palestinian Communities, which is a group that fights evictions of Palestinians for Islamic Relief of Canada's uh, Palestinian Emergency Fund, which provides medical and other aid for Palestinians on the ground, and Ion Palestine, which is an independent uh, Palestinian-run media body that documents abuses of Israel. I will be, who knows, it could go, it could go 12 hours, it could go 18 hours, it could go 24, but I will be matching whatever amount I have left after paying for my dining room table, which costs 37 million fucking dollars. Worth every penny. Uh, will you be doing but, this on yeah. a Chapo FYM? Yes, I will. Can I drop and by? Of course. No, everyone's going to drop in, and no, you will see me either vanquish the monsters of uh, Lothric, of uh, An Orlando, of Yarnum, or see me run in fear. I don't know, but we are going to raise some money and we're going to help some people out. For a good cause. Uh, For one, a good cause. One final plug before we go. Um, I would like to plug a collaboration between our producer, Chris Wade, and the very funny comedian, Sarah Squirm, with Means TV. Sarah Squirm has a new, uh, an- another Squirm short out there called Sarah Vaccine, of which Chris uh, pr- helped produce. It is now on Means TV. Uh, if you are a fan of all things, uh, basically like most of Sarah's videos in comedy, it is an absolute atrocity and an abomination. And I mean that in the best possible sense. It is uh, breathtakingly disgusting and hilarious. Check out Sarah Vaccine, the Means TV x Sarah Squirm x Chris Wade collaboration currently streaming on Means TV. Shout out to them and to Sarah Squirm. I'll put the uh, link to that in the description, as with, as always, links to tickets to Frequency Fest June 5th. Yeah, Sarah is hysterical. Um, if, you, if you don't know about her, uh, you're a fucking loser.